Hi guys, just one second. I know you can't see me yet. Uh, hello and welcome. Hi guys. Uh, sorry, we're going to get started right now. Um, it's nice to have all of you here. Uh, as you can tell, uh, if you guys can see, you can see my uh, costume today. I am Lewis and Clark. And I, well, I'm Lewis or Clark. I'm not actually both of them. Uh, but I, because we're going to be talking about them and the exploration of the Louisiana Purchase, I have my coonskin cap. I also have my trusty musket uh, that you can see, my gun that I have here. Um, Lorna, I could either be Lewis or I could be Clark. So I could be either one, whichever one I wanted to. Hi, Mackenzie and Denali. Hi, guys. Nice to have you guys here. Um, OK, great. Hi, Daria. Hi, Nahalia. I hope I said your name right. Um, oh, Logan, that's so cool that you have that same uh, musket. This is actually my son's musket. It also is his hat, um, too. So, OK, great. We are uh, going to get started. So I'm going to put up my, um, <laughs> Denali, I'm glad you like my costume. Thank you. OK, hello from Pakistan, Hadia. Nice to have you guys here. OK, so we're going to get started. Um, we are going to be talking about Lewis and Clark and their exploration. So if you were with me yesterday, um, you remember that we talked about um, President Jefferson buying for $15 million this land, which was called the Louisiana Purchase. So in 1803, when he bought that land for the United States, they had all this new space, which they needed for more and more people that were coming to settle. The problem was that no one knew much about that land. Some Native American Indians lived there, but they were very much spread out over a large area. And they mostly, those Native American Indians, mostly knew what was nearby, not necessarily what was all the way at one end or another. Um, there were some fur trappers, uh, men who went to catch beavers and different animals for fur, and traders that had been to some small parts of it. But a lot of that land was unmapped and unknown. It was a total mystery. And so it needed to be explored. So President Jefferson found two men to explore it, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. And they got boats and supplies and more men and they, they formed a large group to do just that, to do this exploration. Does anybody know what that group was called? That's right, if you said the Lewis and Clark Expedition, that's what they called this group. An expedition is a, a journey to go explore, to find more things out. Um, so to prepare for this journey, they did a couple of things. Lewis, he studied zoology, which is the study of animals, and botany, the study of plants, and astronomy, the study of stars, and medicine. So he studied all those different things to be ready because they wanted to find out what type of animals were in this new land, what type of plants, um, it, and that was like a big thing they were trying to find out. He also studied all of the known maps of those lands. So he found every map he could get his hands on and then he studied them. So anybody have any guesses as to why he needed to study these things before going on the trip? probably because he was going to try to discover those things. So it was Clark's job, the other, his partner's job, to find and train people who would go with them, to find men who wanted to, to row boats, to do other things. Um, including Lewis and Clark, there were 45 men who became part of this expedition. And they called it the Voyage of Discovery. So they got, they loaded up their boats with food to eat, 
instruments for science because they were going to be doing some different science experiments uh, while they were exploring, guns for protection and gifts for the Indians that they would meet along the way. So on May 14, 1804, they left St. Charles, Missouri and started moving up the Missouri River to begin their expedition. And so you can see, um, Sasha, yes, Sacagawea was part of the expedition and we are actually going to talk to her. Um, we're going to talk about her when we get a little bit further. Um, Louis Pavel, great question. Louis did the studying of the science and the different things like that. And Clark's job was to get the men and supplies and things. So they both had two different jobs. So if you guys look on my map, you can see where the red arrow is, is St. Charles. And that's where they um, began their expedition. And this river, this red line, that is the um, Missouri River, which was what they were going to be following for uh, on their expedition. So they had one large boat and two small ones. And they were actually moving up river. So the Missouri River was coming down this way and they were actually paddling or moving against the current, against the flow of the water. So it was really hard to make progress. They had to row with paddles, they had to row with oars, and um, you can see in the, which that's the picture on the left, the picture on the right are actually these long sticks and what they would do, what they're doing in this picture is they're taking these sticks and they're actually using them to push against the river bottom to move themselves forward. And um, it actually was, it was really, really hard work and they could only do about 15 miles a day. So they could only go 15 miles in the whole time that they were, that they were going and then they had to stop for the day. As they moved up river, they knew they were going to encounter Indians. So to show that they were friendly and that they didn't mean them any harm, that they didn't want to hurt them, Lewis and Clark gave them gifts. They gave them things like beads, face paint, knives, cloth, ribbons, and mirrors. And the other thing is they gave each Indian tribe which is the, a group of Indians of one type that are living together, their chief, which was kind of like their president or their boss, a special coin, which they called the Jefferson Indian Peace Medal. And you can see um, that the picture at the bottom um, is, is the Indian Peace Medal. Um, Lorna, when did they walk? There actually was, when they're a little bit further on their um, journey, they did some walking. They also rode horses. Um, but right now at this point of it, they were just, um, they were just uh, going up river on their boats. So, so the Lewis and Clark told the Indians that the British or that the Americans now owned the land and not the French. And they offered the Indians military protection if they became friends and they were peaceful. Um, so they, so they used, they tried to get them to join them. So if you guys remember, if you were with me yesterday, I talked about the Inca Indians and how when they conquered new people, they actually offered them to join them and to be friends with them and, and gave them the same, um, get, let them be part of their group. Um, Isaiah, great question. I don't really know about the face paint, um, but it was just one of the things that they gave them. Um, Denali, how long did it take um, on their trip? They spent, I think, a total of two years getting to the end and all the way back from their journey. So it took quite a long time. Yes, this is, uh, Lorna, this picture is a picture of Lewis and Clark. Um, meeting with a tribe of Indians. So because they wanted to be friends with the Indians and because 
they gave them gifts and because they um, said that they would protect them if they were friendly and didn't try to attack the Americans, they actually, they only rarely had trouble with an Indian tribe. Um, by November, so remember they started, I think in May, by November, they had gone 1,000 miles to Washburn, North Dakota. So they started here, remember this little, where the river starts in the dark brown part, and they got all the way up to where, um, to Washburn, North Dakota. Lorna, great question. Did the Native Americans join the USA? I don't think they offered to let them join, but they just said that they would let them live peacefully and they would protect them um, if they decided to be friends with them. So this, so November, they spent from May to November and they made it 1,000 miles to Washburn, North Dakota. In this location, they met the Mandan tribe. Because this tribe was so friendly to them, Lewis and Clark and their expedition decided to spend the weather, to spend the winter there with them. So they built this fort, which you can see on the right picture, um, and it was called Fort Mandan, and that was their winter quarters. Because it was not easy for them to travel all year long, it's not like getting in a car and driving somewhere where it doesn't totally matter if there's snow or ice or bad weather. But when you're on a boat on a river, you don't want it to be too cold or too snowy or too icy. Um, so they, um, so they built that and while they were there, they hunted for food, they made leather clothes, they made canoes and they made ropes. And so what they did was they spent that weather, uh, that winter getting ready for the rest of their expedition. And, and um, Clark also made new maps of all the places that they had been. So he had been keeping notes, drawing pictures, things like that. And during this time when they were resting and getting ready for the next part of it, they were, he was drawing some maps. Uh, and Jolly, great question. Washburn is just the place where Washburn, North Dakota, it's just a city in North Dakota or a location. I agree, Lorna, it does look like a winter wonderland there. And I'm sure they were glad to have built some buildings and you can see um, that they have a, uh, that they have some fireplaces. So it was better than being outside in the cold. Um, an expedition, um, Isaiah or Anjali, is, um, is a big journey. It's like when they were, they were exploring, they were trying to find, um, trying to find different places. Cyprus, that is so cool that you have been there. Um, okay, so that's where they spent the wind, um, where they spent the winter. Now, while at that fort, Lewis and Clark met Sacagawea. And has anybody, I know you guys have probably heard of her. So Sacagawea, um, sorry guys, hold on one second, was from a tribe called the Shoshone. Um, but she had been kidnapped by another tribe when she was 12 years old and made to be a slave for that new tribe. Um, a few years later, they sold her to a French Canadian trapper named Charbonneau. Um, and she ended up marrying him. And when she was 17, she became pregnant with their son. And it was while uh, Lewis and Clark were at this fort for the winter that she gave birth to her son. His name was Jean Baptiste. Um, because both Sacagawea and her husband, Charbonneau, spoke many languages, they could be valuable interpreters. They could travel along with them and be able to do translation for them so they could speak to the other Native American Indians that they ran into. So Lewis and Clark hired them um, to, to go along um, with them. Yes, Lorna, I think it is like John the Baptist. Jean Baptiste is a French name because her husband was French Canadian, but I do think that that is what it came from. 
And I agree, she's really pretty. Hello, Henry, glad you could join my webinar. Um, so they hired them. And in April, so remember, um, in November, they arrived at this fort. They spend the winter from, they spent from November to April there, and they were finally ready to leave. Their biggest boat was too big to go much further up the river. So they were gonna have to take smaller boats or canoes up the river. And so what they did was they sent 16 men back down the river to St. Louis with the bigger boat so that they could give reports of their discoveries. I'm sure they also sent letters and different things they wanted people to have. And so the rest of those people, plus Sacagawea and her husband and her little baby, um, went, started up the river again. This time they were paddling in their small boats and the six canoes that they made over the course of the winter. Um, the voyage of discovery was on the move again. And what do you think they discovered next? They discovered where the Missouri River ended. So remember, they started out at the Missouri River. They went all the way up it to the part where it started, so the end of the Missouri River. And what they did was they had to leave their boats. They hid them, and they started going on foot. They started walking. And they started into the Rocky Mountains, uh, which are no small mountains. Um, but, and so it was not easy always for them to find their way, but with Sacagawea's guidance, soon they were in Shoshone territory, which was her first home. So already besides just um, translating, Sacagawea was able to actually guide them where they were supposed to go. So Sacagawea introduced Lewis and Clark to her people, to her tribe, and they were soon friends. Um, one of the many goals besides exploring the land and making maps and seeing what was really out there was to discover a way to get to the Pacific Ocean, hopefully all the way by water. And they, they wanted this to be a Northwest Passage. Um, actually, people have come into the New World since the 1600s, so even 200 years earlier than this expedition, this exploring. I wanted to find a way to go to use water and rivers um, to get from the East Coast to the West Coast. And um, so that was part of the thing that Lewis and Clark and their men were trying to see if it was a possibility. So they asked the chief of the Shoshone Indians about this, and he knew about the Great Ocean, which is what he called the Pacific Ocean. Um, because if you've ever seen the Pacific Ocean, you know how big and huge and massive it is. So I can understand why they called it the Great Ocean. Um, and he said that if they crossed the mountains, which I think he was talking about the Rocky Mountains, they would find a river to take them there. And that is just a picture. My picture on the right is just Lewis and Clark meeting with the different Shoshone Indians. Um, but as you can see, they were where the red um, arrow is and there were many mountains still to cross. These mountains that are right next to it, you guys can see they go from the top of the United States all the way down to where Texas ends and they actually even continue down into Mexico. Those are called the Rocky Mountains. Um, but so they had a lot of mountains that they had to cross. So Sacagawea helped them buy horses from her people. And that was actually really good. Um, and it was good, not only did they not want to walk, but does anybody know why else it was a good thing? And it was good because of the snow. So even, even though it was September, the mountains um, in, the mountains had snow that was really, really deep. And even though they could move faster with horses, they actually almost froze and starved to death. I'm sure, Lorna, that they were very pretty horses. You can sort of see a picture of them traveling through the mountains. Um, the person on the horse is Sacagawea, and she's wrapped in a blanket. I'm sure she has her little baby under there with her to keep him warm. 
Um, but it just was so cold and the snow was deep. And so the horses helped them um, not only have to not walk totally through the snow, um, but to be able to move faster. So, Holly, I don't think they cut open the horses and sleep in them to warm up, though that would have been if they were very desperate, something they could have done. Um, so after 11 very difficult days, they came down out of the mountains and they came into the land of the Nez Pierce. So the Nez Pierce had never seen any white people before and they greeted the starving group and they fed them a feast. Um, now, there is a story, there is a very famous um, Chief Joseph, who was the chief of the Nez Pierce, is a very well-known um, Native American Indian chief. He's very famous, um, and he actually um, um, was relayed this story, which he wasn't alive when Lewis and Clark came through, but it was a story that he was told from his ancestors. So. Um, Actually, he probably was alive, but he wasn't the chief. So decades later, tens of years later, um, Chief, chief Joseph told others the story he'd been told. He said, they brought many things which our people had never seen. They talked straight, which meant they didn't try to trick them. They just used good communication and talked with them like they would talk with anybody. And our people gave them a great feast as proof that their hearts were friendly. They made presents to our chiefs and our people made presents to them. We had a great many horses of which we gave them what they needed and they gave us guns and tobacco in return. Uh, yes, so that's the story. That kind of shows um, that, the, that Lewis and Clark there intention what they wanted to do was they wanted to make friends with the Native American Indians. They didn't want to take anything from them. They were interested in treating them fairly and uh, nicely. Sasha, why tobacco? I think it's just tobacco was something they had to trade um, because in the time during that time the the United States grew a lot of tobacco. And so, um, so it was just something they had to trade. So Lewis and Clark um, learned that there was a river called the Clearwater River that ran through the Nez Perce land that could take them to other rivers that would eventually take them to the Pacific Ocean. And that was what they were trying to do. They were trying to make it all the way across that new land to the Pacific Ocean. So they spent several days among the Nez Pierce, and what they did was they built out these canoes called dugout canoes, which were for the next part of their journey. You guys can see in the picture, if you're not familiar with it, the way you, they made a dugout canoe was that they would cut down a tree or maybe half a tree, and then they would burn out or carve out the inside to make a canoe. That's why it's called a dugout canoe because they would dig it out. Um, the Indians used the tobacco for smoking. Um, I agree, Ethan, that's a really good point. Thomas Jefferson was also really interested in befriending the, na um, the Native American Indians. He wanted to make friends with them. And that was part of the, the reason that I think Lewis and Clark did such a good job at that. How, I don't know that other name for that tribe. Thank you, Lorna. Is it the Nim, Nimi Poo tribe? I think that is maybe the, I, hopefully I said that right. So what they did was they worked with that tribe and they, they built um, some canoes. I see a couple of you guys have raised your hand. Um, if you could just type in the question into the q and I'll try to answer it. Anjali asked, did they grow cotton? I'm not sure if they grew cotton. Um, the, the tribes, many of them would make 
clothing from animal skins from the animals that they um, that they hunted. So they left. <laughs> Denali, I agree that it's a nice. It sounds like a nice group to be with. Um, so once they left that tribe and they set off in their canoes and they, their hope was to arrive at the end of their journey, which was the Pacific Ocean. Now, there were many dangerous rapids on the Clearwater River and then the Snake River. So they started in the Clearwater River, they traveled to the Snake River, and then finally the Columbia River. Um, and there were many, many rapids in them, um, but they survived them all. So have any of you guys ever been whitewater rafting or been on any sort of river where there were rapids? I know I have. Um, so that would be, um, <laughs> it would be scary to do that. Um, me, nai, my, poo, you. Hopefully I did that right. Thank you, Lorna. I learned something new every day. Um, so it's, a rapid is where, um, do you guys see in this picture here with the white water? We call that a rapid. And what it means, what it usually shows is that there are rocks or the water might be more shallow in places and the river is rushing over it. So this right here, where all these, um, where all that white water is, is what we call rapids. So it just means it's gonna be a little bumpy or fast or a little dangerous. Your boat might tip a little bit to the side. Um, so, sorry guys, I think I went too far. Oh, I went really too far. Oh, sorry. I'm actually going the wrong direction. Sorry, guys. Okay, so they passed through those three rivers. And by November, they had canoed far down the Columbia River, near the end of it. So you can see how close they are um, to, to the Pacific Ocean. And yes, Denali, you have been on a... Uh, a raft with me. We did raft together down the rapids. That was a lot of fun. Um, so you can see by November where they had gotten to. Now, does anybody know what water is at the end of the Columbia River? It's the Pacific Ocean. So they were actually, they knew they were getting close to it because now there were tides. So the water was coming in and going out. It wasn't just all flowing together. Um, and the water was starting to get salty. So when they drank it or they splashed in it, they could tell. And that was the way they knew that they were close to the ocean. Um, but that day, so that day when they were close to the ocean, they couldn't get in because there was a giant storm with dangerous winds and waves. And they weren't gonna be able to continue anymore, so they actually had to pull their boats out of the river um, and camp. And there, so um, finally the storm ended and they could continue that last little short distance. So after almost 14 months and 4,000 miles, the explorers had made it to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and you can see them there at the Pacific Ocean. Um, that's cool that you've been there, Cyprus. Yeah, we're gonna show, um, we're gonna I'm gonna show some pictures. I know uh, my son and Cyprus have been on a field trip to go to a place um, where, where they came to. Hadia, I'm so glad that you like all the cool stuff I have to tell. Um, I actually love this idea of them seeing the Pacific Ocean for the first time. Every time I'm at the ocean, which I live pretty close to the Pacific Ocean, um, I like to think about what it would have been like for them um, to see that for the first time and have traveled so long and so many miles um, 
that it just must have been quite incredible. So, so now it was mid-November by the time they got to the Pacific Ocean and they knew that winter was going to come very soon. And they knew they wouldn't be able to, they needed to wait until the spring to, um, to, lit, to, um, to get ready to go. Sasha, I live in Oregon. I live about an hour from the Pacific Ocean and a couple hours away from actually this fort that we're gonna talk about, Fort Katsop. Um, so it's, this is, um, this is really close. This area is really close to where I live. Um, Kiyosha, that's so cool that, um, one of your friends has a relative who did that. Um, <laughs> Cyprus, yes, it is a little fort, but I agree. It is very epic. So, so they needed to stop somewhere and they needed to get ready for their journey. Remember the winter before they had built a fort and they spent all winter uh, making canoes, making maps, ropes, food, all those things. So, so they actually built a fort called Fort Clatsop near where the Columbia River enters the ocean. It's now near a part of Oregon which is called Astoria, Oregon. And the expedition sent, spent the winter there and they traded with the Clatsop and Chinook Native American tribes. And you can actually, today, you can see a replica of the fort. Um, so these are some pictures of them. This is just like the inside. This is not the original one, but um, they have built it. Um, my son has gone on a field trip there. I know Cypress was saying he had, um, and, it, and you can just kind of see uh, what it was like then. Yes, I agree, Cyprus. It is a good model of what it would look like. So, so they stayed there until March. And Lewis and Clark, they left Fort Clatsop and they started up river for home. So they started going back the way they came. Um, they got their, their horses back that they had left. They crossed the mountains again to get back to the, their friends, the Shoshone. Um, and this time, they didn't have so much trouble with snow. Um, I think, um, Lorna, I'm sure that the Chinook did have Chinook salmon to trade. Um, I'm sure they got a lot of great things from them as well as berries and, and different things like that. So this, so going home, if you've ever made a long trip, and I can imagine these guys are no different, going home is always easier than going there. Um, especially for them because now they know what to expect. On their way to the Pacific Ocean, it was all new. It was, and they didn't really have any idea of what it was going to be like. So this, I can imagine, was probably a little bit better. So shortly after this, after they met up with the Shoshones, they um, found the boats that they had left hidden and the Missouri River, and they sailed downriver to the Mandan lands. Where, which was where they built their original fort and they spent their first winter. Um, on August 12th, they said goodbye to Charbonneau and Sacagawea and um, um, she had been such a huge help um, to the expedition. They, they truly could not have done it without her. Um, Cleo, that's a great point. Yes, they are going downriver, which definitely um, would make it a lot easier. Um, so historians believe that she died in 1812, soon after giving birth to her second daughter, um, a daughter named Lizette. After that, Clark actually took care of both Jean Baptiste and Lizette until they were grown. Um, and they stayed in touch, uh, Sacagawea and her husband and these men that she had led um, stayed in touch. So once they said goodbye to Charbonneau, Jean-Baptiste and Sacagawea, um, they continued down the Missouri River and they arrived at St. Louis, Missouri on September 23rd, 1806. It had taken two years and four months and they had traveled almost 8,000 miles, but they had done it. They completed their voyage of discovery and they received a hero's welcome.
Um, once they got to St. Louis, Lewis and Clark, they immediately went to Washington, D.C. To, to share their discoveries with President Jefferson. They'd done their job really, really well. They brought back 120 new animals or animal specimens, so they might not have all been alive, but maybe some dead ones as well. 200 new plant samples for scientists to study. And they had actually learned so much about the land that they traveled, the rivers and the mountains of the Louisiana Purchase. Um, they also were able to make very valuable maps of that area. So now maps could exist and people moving into that area would know what to expect. They'd know where there'd be mountains, rivers, hills. Um, and they could also say that there was no all water Northwest Passage to the Pacific. So that they knew like while you could travel on water for a lot of the time, there was not one way that you could get in a river somewhere and go all the way through that water. Um, and finally, they'd made many new friends, um, the Native Americans that they'd met along the way. Um, so they, um, so they accomplished their goals. They did a really, really great job. So Meriwether Lewis went on to become the governor of Upper Louisiana Territory, so the top part of it. But sadly, he died in 1809, only three years after the voyage of discovery. But William Clark um, lived a long life. He also became a governor of the Missouri Territory, um, and he lived much longer, dying in 1838 at the age of 68. Um, there would be so much more to learn about that land, of course, but because of President Jefferson's vision, his dream for exploring this land and expanding the United States, and Lewis and Clark's adventurous expedition, the Louisiana Purchase wasn't a mystery anymore. They had some basic ideas of, of what was out there, and the maps and different things were actually quite accurate. So thank you guys so much um, for joining my webinar. I hope to see you guys next week. Um, if you guys are interested in studying any more of the courses or finding out more about the things that my web, my classes are based on, you can check out heronbooks.com um, to, to find out more. I have a history and timelines one and some different things that I think you might find um, interesting. Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you guys have a really, really great day.